Thank you for taking the time to watch my video. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up as that will help grow my channel. If you'd like to subscribe, I'd appreciate that as well. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave those and I will respond. Again, thank you. So before we get started on this week's video, just a reminder that I am running a contest for all those people that leave a comment on my video saying contest and also please subscribe. When I get to 500 subscribers, I will be doing a drawing and giving away a free bowl that I've made. So please uh, take the time to leave a comment and if you haven't already, please subscribe. So this is most likely going to be a two-part video. And the reason I say that, and I've done these videos before, is this is a log that I got, that I purchased off Facebook. And it's interesting for a number of reasons. But it's, I've had it for a couple of years and it's been drying, but a log this size would take a long time to dry. Probably take, uh, probably take six years to dry in this form. Uh, so right now I tested it with my moisture meter. It's actually not too, too bad. It's about 17, 18%. I'd like to see it down around 10, 12 before, before uh, I turn it into a bowl because then I know that it's going to be stable and it's not going to move on me. But what I can do is I can turn it down to kind of look like a bowl and then let it dry in that shape. Instead of being this thick at 12 plus inches, I'll turn it down so the walls will be about an inch thick and then it'll dry much, much quicker. So this is actually, uh, goes by a number of names. It's maple, it's Manitoba maple or box elder maple. It's probably more commonly known than Manitoba maple. For those in the States, they wouldn't know where Manitoba was. Uh, so it is a it is a good wood to turn. Uh, maple's always nice. There's some other things going on with this as well. Uh, you can see this has actually been in a fire, so there's, there's that. But there's also this piece here, which is all burl. Now, box elder burls are very nice. This doesn't have a lot of burl to it. Sometimes they'll get burls and they get very spiky. So if you see on YouTube videos of people that have them, the uh, the wood that's got the really spiky pieces. That's a that is a box elder burl. This one doesn't have any spikes on it. It's not that advanced. It also looks it's hard to tell because it's been in a fire, but it looks like it's got some spalding in it. Spalding is always good. The other thing that make that box elder or Manitoba maple can get is flame. Now flame we probably won't see until we cut into it. Not flame like the fact that it's burnt on the outside, but flame inside, it, same thing that causes a burl will cause flame and it'll actually turn red streaks inside the wood. It's, a, it's, it's from a bug, a parasite that gets into the wood, but it does make for a pretty wood with the red streaks. Well, let's go ahead and start processing this up. I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to do. I'll do some some thinking off camera, otherwise the video would be way too long. I'm not a fast thinker. Uh, I'm probably going to try initially to chew something with this burl, just because I think the end grain, just because I think the grain in this section might be good. Uh, so I'm going to think about that, and then I also got to just think about the biggest size that I can get on my lathe, which for me is 12 inches. And then the other thing is how I avoid the very center, the pith which typically tends to crack. So how do I get rid of the pith? How do I maintain the most amount of wood? How do I take advantage of any features like this burl that's kind of here on the side? And how do I avoid cracks that are already existing in the bottom? Small cracks I can fix, uh, big cracks not so much. So I'm gonna stop here, do some thinking, and then we'll come back.
Every time I use my chainsaw, I say, oh, my chainsaw is dull, i got to sharpen the blade. I never do, and then the next time I use it, I repeat the process. My chainsaw is dull. So I cut this burl off. It's not going to end up being a big bowl, but it's good news. There's flame. I mentioned that earlier, that red streak you see there, that's not from the chainsaw, that's not dirt, that's in the wood. You can see the red rings around this, uh, what looks like it would have been a branch possibly. That is, that is flame maple. So that's a nice piece of wood. Again, not going to be big. Uh, I might be able to get uh, six, seven inches round out of it. And um, probably three, three inches deep. So probably seven by three. But I think it's going to be some nice grain patterns. So I'm going to mark this up. Uh, we'll make some further trims on it, get the corners cut off. It's not very heavy, so that's good. Even though it's not round, uh, it shouldn't cause too much vibration on my lathe. So, Although I haven't decided yet, I may mount it on a faceplate with hot melt glue. I think I will. Just because that seems like uh, it's pretty big grain, so I don't know how well it'll hold the worm screw. So I may glue a plate on it instead. Uh, so let me go ahead and do that, and we'll come back and I'll show you what that looks like. Come over here at an angle. Because the bottom of it is also out of round, like I got a high spot here and a low spot here. So that's going to make it out of balance as well. But I can quickly straighten that up as well. And as you can already see, it's already turning more than what it was. The other thing is just having the tool on it slows it down a little bit more. Ideally, I'd have the ability to go even slower, but that's as slow as my lathe will go. So I'll do a little bit more, just get it a little bit more round, and then we should be good. So... Off camera, I did just a, a couple passes, and you can see here, I was taking a good quarter of an inch off of that with a push cut. If you watch my last video, just putting the bevel of the gouge here, coming up the side of the bowl, pushing that material. And and you can see now, it's, it's pretty round. I mean, obviously, I'm missing a bit here. Uh, but other than that, I don't have any high spots. So you can see now... It's turning smooth, there's no vibration, it doesn't take very long. It doesn't take very long to get out of that white knuckle zone where it's, it's vibrating. It's, it's pretty good there now. I'm going to smooth it up a little bit more. Obviously this is the bottom of the bowl. We will turn a tenon on the bottom so that we can flip it around. And uh, then we'll start working the inside. So let me do a couple more passes here and then we'll come back. So here you can see I'm just cleaning up the outside of the bowl and I'm doing the push cut that I talked about, removing about a quarter of eighth of an inch uh, each pass up the bowl. It's, it's giving me a good surface and uh, now I'm just working the bottom and forming, I'm going to eventually form a tenon and then I will mount that in my chuck and then finish both the outside and the inside. And I've gotten rid of all of the wood that's not solid. Uh, I'm not liking the shape. It's too deep right now, given the diameter. So I'm going to take a bit off of this. But uh, it's looking pretty good. Here you can see the process of hauling out the ball. I typically use my ball gouge. I start out near the rim and plunge in and use my bowl gouge, ride the bevel, and go down the outside wall. Here I moved in towards the inside and I pull out. Once I start establishing the wall, then I'll work back and forth between going down the wall a ways and getting it a bit deeper, and then coming to the middle and uh, cleaning the inside out. The number one question that I get asked is how long it takes to turn a bowl. 
What you're seeing here is hollowing out the inside of a bowl in real time. And this is probably slower than working the outside, but what you're seeing here is in real time. You can see that I'm moving a lot of material at once and I'm just working down the outside wall of the bowl and across the bottom. I think it took me about 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes to completely hollow out the uh, inside of this bowl. If you watched last week's video, uh, you'll recall that I spoke about two areas when you're turning a bowl that, especially the inside of a bowl, that are most problematic. Number one is this center nib that I'm working on here. As I get down to the very bottom, I want to make sure that that's level, that I don't have either a dip or a hump at that point. So that's one area that's a little problematic. The other area when hollowing out a bowl is right here, and that is the transition between the wall and the bottom. You do have to be careful when coming into this area. I apologize, my arm's in the way. When coming into this area, that you do not get a catch with the gouge. A catch is when the tool digs in and removes material in an uncontrolled fashion. So you do have to be careful when you're working that transition area from the wall to the bottom of the bowl. I've shown this before. This is my homemade kiln and it's not very complicated and I did do a, a video on this earlier but all it is is a cardboard box and I'll put my bowl inside of there. It's got a fan here that's off of a computer and it'll pull all the air in it that I require. This light bulb is my 100, 100 watt bulb and that's my heat source. So I just plug that in. And then I put this tin foil shield over it, up against the box. It pulls the air through here into my box and then exits out the top. I close the top up just to restrict the air. And uh, I leave the bowl inside. I've left the bowl, I left the bowl inside for three days and it dropped the moisture down from the 17 at which I started down to below 10. When I first started turning the bowl, I was getting some tear out. It wasn't sanding well. So I turned it down so that it was almost to final thickness, just a, probably about three quarters of an inch thick, a little bit less. And then I stopped at that point just because I wasn't getting the sanding that I liked. So I put it inside this kiln for three days. And like I said, at the end of those three days, the moisture was below 10. It sanded much better. Uh, it, it didn't go out around because it hadn't been that wet in the first place, but uh, it did sand and finish up much, much better. Now the bowl is mounted in the tenon, in the chuck, and I finished the outside. Here you can see some areas that have some bark inclusion with a bit of a hole. Those are going to have to be fixed. In order to fix those, I use super glue, CA glue, and some coffee grinds. Coffee grinds actually form a very natural looking repair in the end because coffee ends up looking an awful lot like bark. Now in order to fill this holes I don't need a lot of glue so I'm because I don't want a lot of coffee around the area because that's just going to be going to be sanded off so I just put a very small amount right there in the hole trying to fill that gap once I've got that I'll sprinkle some coffee grounds in there again wipe away the access so it's 
fairly smooth. Just put a little more glue in there. If you if you put a lot extra in there, when you go to clean it up, it's just gonna it'll just end could end up just pulling out. So you want to make sure that you get good coverage of the coffee grinds with the glue and that it's fairly smooth. Hit that with a little bit of accelerator. That just speeds the process up. And that's pretty smooth. If you remember, I had mentioned that this had some bark inclusion. I filled that here with coffee grinds, and you cannot tell at all. It blends in quite seamlessly. Here you can see some of the flame maple. You see this up in the top, quite red. Here on the side of the bowl, one side of the bowl is almost completely red. And here you see some bark inclusion and some red from the flame maple. So here's this week's bowl. Uh, it turned out very well. Uh, you can Hopefully you can see that there. There'll be some close-up shots later, but you can see the flame, the red marks in the side of the bowl, uh, very evident throughout it. Uh, turned out to be a beautiful bowl. And uh, it is for sale. It's just over a little, just a little over six inches in diameter and a little over three inches tall. And uh, it does have my logo in the bottom and laser engraved. I didn't show that, but I did laser engrave it. So beautiful little bowl. And uh, again, that's for sale. Please leave a comment if you have any. Uh, thumbs up, that would really help. And uh, thank you for watching my video.